Welcome to Blackbird episode number 11. My name is James, and if you know me, you know how excited I am to be interviewing Thaddeus Russell today. Um, So I'm not going to give him a huge introduction. You know who he is, and if you don't, you will at the end of this episode. Um, Before we get started, though, I do want to tell you once again about BU Enterprises. Juliet Nail of BU Enterprises wants to welcome you back into your body through fitness and yoga and personal wellness and just you know, being mindful of your own body, Juliet will coach you to, Juliet can coach you back to health. Whether you're an individual who's interested in one-on-one training or if you own a business or manage a team and would like to provide wellness as a benefit to your employees, Juliet is ready and waiting to help you. Head to buenterprises.com to get in touch with Juliet and she looks forward to hearing from you. And so with that, here is my interview with Thaddeus Russell. All right, Thad Russell, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, my honor, James, and I'm so glad you're doing this. And it seems like you're off to a flying start. I saw your list of guests that you've had on the show, and I'm amazed already you've had some A-list people. I'm just a peon here, but I'm really, really glad to be here. You're a... Your 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 compliments are very well taken. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, for the the couple of people who might not know who you are, why don't you kind of give your elevator pitch of uh, of who Thad Russell is? Well, I've been running for president, and I hope I get your. Oh, I guess that's over. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Thad Russell was born in Berkeley, California, in 1965. So I've already aged myself, and people will be shocked to hear how old I am. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. So you're not and, quite uh, a boomer. So that's, that's good. We're, we're very fuck, anti-boomer here on fuck boomers. So. Nah, fuck the boomers. God damn. I can't wait for them to die so we can get their houses. Uh, gosh, it's already a, we're off to a dark start here. I, um, <laughs> many people might know this. I don't know that I, I was born and raised into a, a left-wing Trotskyist Marxist family in Berkeley. And my parents were professional revolutionaries. And I really mean that. Um, until the late seventies, we can talk about what that means if you want. But, um, so yeah, I come from the left and then I am myself sort of took up the mantle and was a lefty socialist for, um, again, in a real serious way from the time I went to college until I would say the late nineties, about 2000. Um, so I went to college in 80, sorry. Uh, I went to college in 1984. So from 1984, to about 2000, I was definitely a man of the left and a socialist, a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, the whole nine yards. And since then, though, since about 2000, I have gone through quite a few transformations in my thinking on politics and really everything, actually. So, uh, But I got a PhD at Columbia in history, and I wrote a, my first book on Jimmy Hoffa and the labor movement. And the second book I wrote was Renegade History of the United States, which many people might know about. And I'm about to finish, I swear to God, my third book. I know, James, you give me a lot of shit about this. Yeah, you're probably, a, that's a long you're probably time. the king of giving me shit about it, but it's good. It's good um, that you do because I need, I need that push. Yeah, I have about mm, 20 pages left to write on the, my last third book, not last third book, which is a very large, very ambitious, and this is why it's taken me so long, James, project that my publisher asked me to take on. It was not my idea, which was to write the entire history of U.S. foreign relations, but not just the standard stuff. I have to do the standard stuff about wars and what's called regular foreign policy, but also mm-hmm. my sort of original contribution, which is tracing the the development, the history, the diffusion of American popular culture around the world over the last about 120, 130 years. And I make the argument that American popular culture, especially like its lowbrow forms, has done much more to liberate people in foreign lands living under authoritarian rule than anything the U.S. military has done. So that's meant things like finding out how many phonographs were sold in Cairo in 1910. You know, the the research is hard, James. I believe it. Yeah, no, it, it's been actually, I love it. I love writing the book. It's it's this that I've been very busy and this is finishing my my biography here. 
been very busy for the last almost four years now. Wow. Uh, with the Unregistered Podcast and with building Renegade University. And at RU, we have, RU has really turned a corner in the last year. We have a whole bunch of new courses. We have webinars going on almost all the time. We have one tonight and one that'll go for three weeks. And then another one that starts just after that in March. And it's been very exciting. And the podcast has been the thing I'm most proud of in my whole professional career. Of all the things I've done, PhD, the books I've written, teaching courses, being a professor. I was a professor, by the way, for 25 years at various schools. Um, all those things, nothing. I am more proud of Unregistered than anything else I have done professionally. It's, um, it's where I fully express myself. And it just, I have a very deep satisfaction with it. And, um, I'm very proud of it. So yeah, that's me. I think, uh, I think my very favorite episode of unregistered, um, was the one with the lawyer for the Osho cult. Yeah. That wasn't, I mean, to hear him tell it, it wasn't really a cult, but to hear anybody else tell it, it probably was, uh, it came right, it came out right around the time that documentary came out on Netflix. And I can't remember the name of it. Wild, yeah. wild kingdom uh, or something like that. That's what, uh, uh, wild, 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 wild country, Wait, something like Jesus, that. Jesus I'll find Christ. it and put it in the show yeah. notes if we can't remember yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's a that's that's my favorite episode, just because huh. of how how real that guy got. Um, mm -hmm. You're able to pull that stuff out of people. Um, I'm hoping that you can start doing the in person stuff again, because sitting in his dining room is a little bit different from doing it over for Zoom. Sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We will. I'm, in fact, I'm about to talk to a video videographer here in San Francisco who's worked with us. It's a great guy um, about doing in persons in the Bay Area. Yeah. And, That's you know, awesome. having it, but now that I'm committed to doing video, it's all video since last April, May. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the weird thing is I can't really do, I can't do an audio only. So like if I do an in-person interview, I have to have a cameraman with me. Right. And so it's like, it's, it's been really great in that it's much easier to book guests now with zoom, but what it did was it sort of committed the show to being video only. So we can't really release an audio only at this point. Cause we've released about, I don't know. We've been solid weekly. We have not missed a week since like March, April. So however many that episode, how many, however many uh, episodes that is, uh, have been in video. So the fans will not allow me, I'm sure, to go back to audio. But anyway, I, that's boring in the weed stuff. <laughs> yes, uh, it's been uh, just f fucking amazing. And the people I have met, the people I have become friends with through it, life changing, life changing. So. Yeah, you uh, you went on sort of a whirlwind tour with Brett Vinat uh, a few years ago, which you know, I, I mean, for what it was, that was that was an awesome tour for both of you guys, um, mm -hmm. even if there wasn't uh, much follow up, I guess. Um, uh, and you know, I mean, you guys are pretty public that you. Uh, I would, I mean, would you call it a falling out? Is it just more of a you went separate ways? Oh, we can talk about this all you want. Um, yeah, so Brett and I had a partnership early in Renegade University. And we, he co-sponsored, I think two or three of our first Renegade University weekend events, which were fantastic. Got a lot of School Sucks people to come and it was great working with Brett. And he was on my podcast and I was on School Sucks podcast. I mean, I'm not kidding. You can go look at, it, I think like 30 <clears throat> times. Yeah, a ton of times. It's not like, three, yeah, just a lot, a lot. And I really loved it. It was great. We always had a great conversation and Brett seemed to appreciate it. And he, he stayed at my house for about five days, a couple of years ago to be on my podcast at that time. And um, then I was on his podcast and we wanted, he wanted to talk about alcoholism, which was fantastic. Cause I've, he and I are both recovering alcoholics and I'm always game for those kinds of discussions instead of politics. Basically that's another thing about me, even though I'm a political guy, I am, my top priority is always personal stuff to talk about in public. And that's yeah. one of the, one of the ways in which unregistered is different than almost all other political podcasts. But this, I, I, I said something in it that really upset Brett. Um, I don't know if we need to go. I can, I can, if you want, but there was a thing I said about him and his effects on other people when he was drinking. Um, and I was actually trying to make him feel better by saying that, you know, he was assuming that he had done this damage to these people when he was drinking. And I sort of, I kind of like dug into it a bit and asked him, well, what did you actually do? What did you actually do? And there was no violence, nothing that I 
heard that was anything other than being quiet <laughs> in a relationship. And I just said, you know, that's, it's actually kind of narcissistic to assume that you have all this negative power over other people. Um, and, but I was saying it's also bad for you because it, it, you're carrying this guilt around that you don't need to carry, you know, and uh, you can, guys can all listen to it. I forget exactly which episode, but you can find it. It was the last, my last appearance on School Sucks. And then um, Brett didn't say anything to me. And then about, I'm really guessing here, but about a month later, something like that, someone told me that he released a, a patrons only episode and I listened to it and it was a full hour of him just talking about me and how he had to break up with me. Um, <laughs> and, and that was it. And Brett has never communicated with me directly. He, he, uh, basically severed relations via, a semi-private podcast episode. Um, and, well, and yeah, and I don't think, and, and just so that the audience doesn't think we're gossiping or whatever, I, I don't think it's out of turn to, to, you know, say that we're like airing someone's dirty laundry. He's been pretty, you know, out front about it. He just recently released an episode um, that I, th I thought was fantastic. I listened to him just as much as I listened to you. Uh, I don't, I don't have a favorite parent, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. I, and he talked about, you know, his relationships and how some of them have been strengthened and some of them he just had to let go and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's hard feelings or anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like we're you know, talking shit or whatever. Yeah. And well, obviously if he, if he did a whole podcast episode, he's not trying to keep it a secret. I'm just saying, you know, you asked whether it was a uh, falling out. I mean, not for me is what I was getting yeah. at. You know, yeah. I don't, he, as I said, he chose to do this. I had never had any issue. I mm. did not want to have a falling out with Brett, um, but he did with me. So yeah, I'm not angry. I never was um, or upset or hurt, but I, I guess he was. And, you know, I'm, sort of sorry about that but i also think honestly that he's not really he wasn't really listening to what i was trying to say there as my feeling about it so well and I that should... that kind of gets into your um your feelings about empathy in general i think mm. you mm. you like reject empathy as a concept don't you mm -hmm. yeah interesting why is that what what well, what, where were you going with that in terms of, well, these are Brett, like, well, because, you know, in, in therapy where you're being told how you've impacted people without actually talking to the people you impacted, a lot of times those negative impacts are projected. Yes. Um, and it's too, it's the, the, the goal of that is to build empathy mm -hmm. in the person. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and in a lot of cases, what it does is just make assumptions about what you did based yeah. on uh, statistics that may or may not be good statistics, because we know how, you know, the science of human behavior uh, responds to uh, statistics. You know, I mean, right. there's, there's, there's a replicability pr uh, crisis, a replication pr crisis in behavioral science for a reason. Right. Um, yeah. So empathy, my take on empathy is that I'm, at least highly skeptical about it. Um, but also at times I get a bit indignant about it because, you know, the idea that someone else can inhabit my mind, um, that can really know my thoughts, my feelings, my needs, my desires, my fears, my joys, really, really feel those things the way that I feel them first of all, you can never prove that obviously. Right. And second of all, I find it to be, um, somewhat imperialistic, right? I mean, there's this claim that, you know, what's the difference between, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, but yeah, you know, before every war abroad, there's been all these claims made about that what's going on in the minds of the poor people we're going to save with our military interventions. Right. That, we that's know why <laughs> That's yeah. why the the constant references to Biden's empathy always uh, <laughs> struck me as a little a little spooky. Well, he felt the pain of all the people he put in prison, and he felt the pain of all the Iraqis <laughs> who were killed by the war that he authorized. So, yeah, I um, so I'm skeptical of it. You know, then again, it's funny because I am actually credited with being exceptionally empathetic. And that is actually one of the things about unregistered that I think sets it apart. People would see, I think most people would consider 
that show to be quite a bit about, or sort of me demonstrating my empathy actually for other people. But I don't know what I'm actually doing. I, I guess you know when we see moments of what we call empathy, what's a better way to categorize that? And I haven't thought through that yet. Well, like, you're super a, curious. I mean, that's what it, that, that's really what it is. You you yeah. know that you can't read the person's mind, so you just keep asking questions. Yeah, I think it's probably. Thank, thank you for saying that. That's really that's really cool. No one's ever said that, but that's. Curiosity, I guess, is my, that's what I value more than anything else in a person. I really care a lot. You know, when I'm in a relationship, which could be a friendship, a family relationship, or a romantic relationship, if the person doesn't ask me questions about myself, I, I, I get turned off. It's, um, it's not going to go very far as a relationship for me. And, you know, I've, it's actually fairly rare, I, I'm, unfortunately, <laughs> to find a person who is really curious about others. Um, and I think that's part of the problem with a lot of media, actually. There's not, yeah, I'm just, I am like just lustfully curious <laughs> about, uh, about you and your life. You know, well, you and I, James, you and I, I remember, I'll never forget it. In fact, I was just telling my girlfriend about it when we, at the RU Washington event, um, you were there and I remember we had this, we walked, you and I were walking through, I think it was the FDR Memorial. The creepiest uh, thing in Washington, DC. It's it is it's so unbelievably totalitarian. <laughs> it's like, yeah, go to the FDR monument and tell me that that fucker wasn't a fascist. I mean, it is so totalitarian, everything about it, but you told me your story and I was blown away by it. And I think about it a lot and, um, you really opened up to me. So what, you know, what do we call that? Like, was that, I mean, well, it was my curiosity. I was just dying to know like what your experiences were like. Um, and I wanted to, I still have more questions for you, by the way, yeah. <laughs> about what you told me a lot more questions. So yeah, I am super curious about other people and that can sometimes be annoying though. It's not just a virtue. It's not a simple virtue. It can be quite annoying. It can be prying. You know, a lot of people don't want to be asked questions about themselves. They get very uncomfortable, right? And I, I've noticed that in about half the people I encounter, roughly. R roughly half are just don't want to do it. And the other half are surprised because they don't experience it much. But yes, that's what I value more than anything in a human being. Is time, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, no. my, <laughs> that reminds me of my mom. Actually, my mom self-identifies as an empath. So, uh, so there's yeah. that, but she, she's also super curious and doesn't have much of a filter. Like she'll ask anybody, anything up to the point where one time when my, my dad was just getting his foot in the door in like the corporate world, they were at some like business person's house and, you know, st standing around drinking wine or whatever it was. And my mom, this 23 year old, you know, wife of some guy who's just a junior partner at whatever, whatever real estate company. Um, she, she, she just chimes into the conversation with, so how long, how long y'all been rich? <laughs> just, just the most off the wall question you can possibly ask somebody. Mm. Um, so what, a <laughs> if someone asks you That's like, funny. what, what do you do for a living? What do you uh, tell them? Oh, now I say podcaster. Okay. Um, but then I follow, if I have time, I follow up quickly with, I'm also a professor and I, I run my own university. That's, that's how I, that's nice. the real quick, real quick way to go. But it's true. I mean, that's, that's, those are my major sources of income. Um, it is my occupation for sure. I don't, I no longer teach at Normie, Normie universities about, I stopped about two years ago. It was the last time I was in a regular college classroom. Guess what? I don't miss. <laughs> do you do you not miss the do you not miss the the university bureaucracy more or do you not miss the incurious students more um so the students were the only good part of teaching in a college you know, the classroom experience was the only good thing about it at all i really despise every other aspect of higher education i mean i i think what the hard sciences are doing is just fine and i don't we're not, we're not, RU is not trying to displace the hard sciences in any way or even compete with them, but we are most certainly competing with the humanities and social sciences and we're kicking their fucking ass, by the way. We are uh, paying our instructors more than they pay theirs who are adjuncts. Oh, nice. and, oh yeah, oh yeah. Our instructors have been making good money, really good money. And we charge 
we did the last webinar we did, I think we did the math, I think it was nine bucks an hour of class time, you know, is what people pay. So it's, yeah. And then, and then you can judge for yourself, but I guarantee you having been an undergraduate, a graduate student, an instructor, and I've been a professor for two decades in elite top level. I was at Columbia, I was at Barnard, I was at Occidental College, New School for Social Research schools. Um, I can tell you that it's the quality of the courses is better than anything I've ever seen in a classroom, including my own classes, because the, many of them are team taught. I've co-taught two courses that were just phenomenally good. <laughs> I mean, one was on postmodernism, which just ended with James Lindsay and James and I were just clicking all the way through. And then before that, Kamasi Hill, uh, who tonight is teaching a course on uh, hip hop, history of hip hop. We did a course on the history of African-American culture and it was amazingly fun. Hotep Jesus was a student in it. And we just got along so well. We co-taught so beautifully, but also we were complementary to each other. I mean, there I there were certain things, a lot of things I didn't know about these topics that they did know and vice versa. So you got like just the most complete, most comprehensive, most incisive analyses of these subjects that I've seriously ever witnessed in even Ivy League colleges. So um I don't know. Was that an answer to your question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, was, you, when you, wasn't well, just, and it wasn't just an ad. It was that really, no, that yeah, really, it, hard, really heartfelt. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. I, and I make sure to link to, I, I link to your courses in every single episode show notes because I like them so much. Oh, um, man. I wasn't able to join the, the postmodernism course live, but I'm looking forward to watching the, the replays. It's amazing. It's so, I mean, yeah, I really, <sighs> It's such a good job of, of a really comprehensive. We really looked at the texts, you know, by these people rather than just spewing off critical race theory, postmodernism, bad, good, whatever. I mean, we really examined about, I'd say, pretty comprehensively examined about seven or eight thinkers, major thinkers from Theodore Adorn, from uh, Antonio Gramsci to Marcusa and Adorno and Derrida and Foucault. And, talk, and then constantly linked it to what, what cur the current politics. And it's really, you know what it is, it's really a history of the current American left. That's what that course is. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the, it's, an ex it's a history and an examination of the philosophical basis of the current American left. Because that's where it all comes from. It comes from mostly critical theory and a little bit of postmodernism. You know, identity politics, woke politics, all this obsession with race, gender, et cetera all comes out of these guys, Marcusa, Adorno, Horkheimer, especially, but also somewhat Derrida and Foucault and Leotard. Um, and yeah, so anyway, it's just, I don't think there's a better way to understand the current American left than taking that course. <laughs> yeah. Um, but well, and by training, you're a historian and I think James Lindsay is a mathematician, right? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. How did you guys, how did you guys come to be the professors of postmodern philosophy? Yeah, it's funny. So I, the first time I read Foucault was in graduate school. It was in a graduate school seminar. I'll never forget it. Taught by Richard Bushman, who is a great early American historian and also uh, very high in the Mormon church, which is a weird thing, but he's a, he's actually an outstanding historian and a great, a great intellectual and very curious. He's, he was what, basically the only good teacher I had at Columbia. I had one good teacher in college and one good teacher in graduate school and, and Dick Bushman was it in at columbia anyway he um he yeah he had us read i think it was discipline and punish a section of it and i you know what i said i was like this is fucking bullshit <laughs> it's just like <laughs> oh yeah this is a like this is a historian who's a historical what and i don't ha i understand i don't understand half the points he's making and it just seemed like seemed like this abstract set of ideas sort of just like laid loosely over the historical record, you know, because Foucault is not great about like chronologically telling the story, right? He mm -hmm. sort of just has these big analyses that he, that he applies to these major, you know, institutions and moments in history. No, I thought it was bullshit. I was done with Foucault when I, by the time I read, <laughs> finished reading him the first time, that was like, that would have been about 1993, four. And then what, I don't know, how did I start reading Foucault? Well, a friend of mine who now teaches at Wesleyan, his name is Jonathan Cutler, basically the most brilliant person I've ever known. And he's responsible for really turning my head in the direction it's now in. Um, he just sort of 
asked me a couple questions and pointed me in a couple directions and said, you should read this. You should think about that. This was in the nineties when I started to change. He's just a genius, but he's not well known because he hasn't published much, but Jonathan Cutler at Wesleyan, if you ever have a chance to encounter him or go to Wesleyan, that's a good reason to do it. Um, he, I think he's the one who turned me onto the postmodernists and explained to me, I, I remember getting into an argument in a bar in New York city one late night graduate school kind of argument with some guy about about postmodernism and calling. I remember I called it a virus. I said, I thought it was dangerous. I sounded like Jordan Peterson back then. Wow. Yeah. And I said, I remember calling it a virus. And I remember the guy saying, well, it's interesting that you keep using the term virus, you know, very, he had this very Foucauldian response to me, yeah. but I was a little junior dumb shit, Jordan Peterson at that point. Um, but yeah, uh, Jonathan at some point said, you know what? If you look at like the original queer theory, if you look at Foucault, if you look at like Derrida, that's that's where freedom is. That's where liberation is. That this is the most liberatory philosophy. And Nietzsche, who's really the granddaddy of all of it. Those those guys really are sort of the pure, purest libertarian, small L um, philosophers you will find in the Western canon. That's it. Nietzsche. Derrida, Foucault, and somewhat Leotard and Baudrillard and those cats. Like they, this is why I keep, this is my campaign, James. You know this, right? For years now, I've been trying to like get libertarians to read this stuff and to see that it's their friend. It's their best friend. And I'm actually succeeding quite a bit. I've noticed there's like at least two libertarian podcasts that focus quite a lot on postmodernism now and they've quite positively. And I've just seen a bunch of change this year. I mean, this last year. Um, it's been really cool and exciting. I didn't expect it to be that easy, actually. <laughs> There's still quite a bit of resistance, but you know, I've been on all the big libertarian shows making, making the argument. I think the best one I did was with on Tom Woods' show most recently with uh, Michael Rechtenwald. I think that's when I really won over a lot of people. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. So on that episode of the Tom Woods show, Michael Rechtenwald ended with saying that you're not a postmodernist. You're just a liberal, like a classical <laughs> liberal who yeah. wants to be edgy or something like that. But on the other hand, I've heard, so that's a non-postmodernist calling a self-described postmodernist, not a real postmodernist. <laughs> I know. On the other hand, I've heard postmodernists refer to Jordan Peterson as just a postmodernist who wants to sound like a conservative. What do you, oh, what do you think that's yeah. all about? Well, I mean, what Michael said about me is just <laughs> not only is it absurd, it's a little bit, it's it's bordering on rude in a way. I mean, he's sort of accusing me of lying, essentially. I think he sort of said that, that I didn't believe what I was saying. Bob Murphy definitely said straight up to me on my own show. On Are you, he invited himself on Are You Live. I, re I remember that. Yeah, that was wild. Um, and he he said, You don't you I don't think you believe what you're saying. And I was like, okay, well, I guess there's nothing to talk about now. I mean, what, what do you, how do you respond to a claim like that, right? <laughs> you're not actually a libertarian, James. You don't actually believe in agorism, James. I think you're really just a, you're just a conservative Republican. I mean, that's, it's the equivalent, you know, as it's, it's not guys out there, everyone out there, it's, you know, in a debate. Don't resort to that tactic. <laughs> it's a uh, sort of below the belt, but, um, about po about Peterson and postmodernism, I've been I have said that at times he totally sounds like a postmodernist, like when he had his infamous, extremely boring <laughs> debates with Sam Harris about truth and truth, reality. Yeah. I mean, Peterson was most definitely on my side in that debate, um, and the th I think it comes from <clears throat> you know what it is. It's these goddamn new atheists, right? They they have to reject it because they're scientistic. You know, athe the atheism. Mm. My father, my father was a big time atheist. I mean, he was like a militant atheist. That was really his religion was atheism, and he also was absolutely in love with science and believed that science was the avenue to truth and that whatever scientists say is what we should listen to and the whole nine yards. Same Sam Harris and his crew, same same mindset same attitude toward this stuff. And, you know, because what the enlightenment did was replace religion, basically religious dogma with science, what was called science, what is called science. Right. And, uh, it became a religion for them, but Peterson, because he's, I mean, he doesn't, I think he's avoided saying this, right. He's definitely religious in some way. He definitely believes in the Bible and stuff. I mean, he's, 
teaches that whole course in the Bible. That alone, of course, doesn't mean anything, but just you can tell anyway, when he was debating Harris, that's really, and also Ben Shapiro, who's a religious Jew, had the same debate with Sam Harris. In both instances, both those guys took the postmodernist position about truth um, in saying, because they wanted, they want there to be truth in scripture, truth in religious texts, truth in religious thinking. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're definitely sort of hostile to this idea that only science can get us to the promised land. Right. So, yeah. I, yeah. Well, and so what about um, Nick Gillespie? He's another, he's another sort of libertarian luminary who, not that you're libertarian. I know you, I know you uh, reject that, that title, <laughs> Thank you. but, uh, but, liber- uh, but, you know, broadly speaking, Nick Gillespie is sort of the other postmodernist libertarian. Yes. And y'all, you guys kind of have different focuses, I think. Uh, yes. Nick, for instance, frequently laments um, the breakdown in like institutions and the, the, the distrust in institution at the population level. Mm. Um, whereas I think you welcome it and, and like mm. try to get people to distrust churches and states and corporations um, and stuff like that. You think Nick is an institutionalist in that way? I don't know. An, establish- I, an establishmentarian. Think, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he works for a reason, so you kind of, it kind of comes with it, but uh. But maybe not. I mean, as far as reason goes, between him and JD Tuchili, I mean, they both kind of, they both kind of go against that grain. Um, yeah, yeah. Jerry is definitely an, an anarchist. He's a real anarchist. Yeah. Nick is not an anarchist, but he's. I don't know. He's. I think he's been pretty anti-establishment in his thinking. Other people at Reason most certainly are not anti-establishment in their thinking. But Nick, yes, he has also been on a bit of a campaign to get libertarians to take postmodernism seriously as an ally, which is what I've been saying. Um, Nick is not as radical as I am. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't, I think he, he doesn't, he doesn't question reality and truth in a postmodernist way. He leaves those sacred still those concepts, but yeah. I wonder, do you think that's because his background's in literature and yours is in history where he's, he's been fully steeped in fictional stuff. So like he doesn't need to reject reality because reality for him is completely different from fiction. Whereas for you, you've been steeped in history, which is sort of the narrativization of reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that might have something to do with it? Well, I mean, in terms of our academic backgrounds and the fields we chose to study, actually historians tend to be really dumb, (laughs) really uh, (laughs) non-intellectual. I mean this when I was at Columbia. So I was in the Columbia University history program, right? I was wearing my PhD. This is arguably the most famous and most prestigious history program in the country, in the world. Mm -hmm. Columbia has produced more famous historians than any other other school. Um, They were a bunch of dunderheads, man, about theory. They were actually, not all of them, but I'd say a good half to three quarters are openly hostile to theory or completely uninterested in it. English departments, on the other hand, where where, um, Nick comes from, are far more subjectivist and far more um, likely to take a radical stance on this kind of stuff because it's all about text, right? It's all about text. That's what they study. Whereas historians have to rely on evidence, you know, deployed in the classical sense, to make their arguments. They're not, you're not going to, I mean, according to historical stand historians standards, one must have essentially objective so-called objective evidence or else the argument is considered to be invalid or unpersuasive. So now there's much more what's called positive positivism in history than in English. So that wouldn't explain it. Um, I should be more conservative on this stuff than, than Nick. <laughs> um, there are, I mean, Foucault is very popular among historians, but they I've never seen anyone among historians do what I do, which is to even question just reality, just truth, how we, how we conceive of those things. Um, like the physical world, you know, when you get to the physical world, that's when people freak out. And all I'm saying is like, let's just not assume 
that what we think is going on right now in our room all around us is what's really going on. Because if you just look at history again, think about all the stuff that people used to think, not even that long ago, but certainly before the modern era, before about 500 years ago. And we're talking about then still millennia of human existence, right? Human beings. Good Lord, right? What did people believe before about 1600? all over the world, I mean, and profoundly believed in it. And when people who like challenged the idea that the sun revolved around the earth got burned at the stake, you know, I mean, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, that we were living spirits, that gods are in the trees, that, you know, animals speak to, I mean, we know, right? Um, Yet we are the first people apparently to get it right. It's so arrogant. It's so arrogant. We are the first people in human history to get it right, except that science is constantly revising its opinions, its positions, its truth claims, even gravity, right? Gravity is like a big bone of contention right now in in, uh, physics. They're now discovering things moving in deep outer space that they're not not moving according to the laws of gravity, you know? So even that one is being challenged. And that's what's beautiful about real scientists. When I had Donald Hoffman on my show, who's a real scientist to the University of California at Irvine, neuroscientist, cognitive scientist, you know, he, this is what he was saying. He's saying what scientists do is constantly try to disprove truth claims. Every truth claim that comes up gets subjected to criticism and attempts to actually overthrow it. That's what real scientists do. So, um, yeah, again, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, it's fine. I don't even remember what the question was. I just like uh, I just like flowing, man. It's cool. Good. Um, so what a if you had to like describe your particular brand of postmodernism, you know, in 30 seconds or whatever, what how would you how would you describe it? Freedom, baby. Freedom, even though postmodernists would pretty much universally call freedom a social construct. And I would agree with them 100% on that. Of course, it's a social construct. And uh, so you have to define what freedom means. And um, although Foucault does have a section, I taught this in the course, he does have a whole section in one of his books where he uses that damn word repeatedly. And I'm like, damn, okay, you're, you're, you're uh, this is, that's when I was totally won over by him. But yeah, if you, it's radical skepticism. That's really it. That's really it. It's curiosity, like we talked about early on, right? It's curiosity. It's radical curiosity and radical skepticism there. I've never said that that way, but that's exactly what it is. I like if you are radically curious or relentlessly curious and radically skeptical, meaning skeptical about everything, it doesn't mean rejecting anything. Rejecting something out of hand would be sort of anti-postmodernist and certainly anti-intellectual. It's really intellectualism. And again, that doesn't mean you're a fancy pants who sits in an Ivy League, you know, tower smoking a pipe. It just means you like ideas. You're mm-hmm. interested in ideas. That's all intellectual means. Well, and it it also doesn't mean that you live your life as if nothing's true. Like I mean, you Exactly. you live your life like a I mean, I guess maybe a, a West Coast libertarian kind so, of what I'm, what I'm perceiving, right, is that there's a chair under me right now, and I'm looking into this screen that's a computer screen, and you and I are communicating via this technology known as Zoom, and that it's about 67 degrees in this room right now, something like that. You know, so that's what my sense is. That's what I'm. That's what I think's going on, right? But and that's how I operate. So you know, I might go to the thermostat and raise it two degrees. I might, you know, change my chair because I don't like the feeling of this chair. I might stand up instead. Um, but yes, I operate according, generally speaking, to what my senses, I think, are telling me. Again, I don't even know if my senses are telling me what's true because, hey, guys, have you ever had a, a case in which your senses uh, lied to you? <laughs> I mean, the the entire year 2020, we were constantly being afraid <laughs> of losing our senses of smell and taste. Uh, <laughs> Right. And, and, and even on like a more metaphysical level, I mean, you, you don't think that killing people is okay. Awesome. No, that's not my position. Um, I, I, so I'm also amoral. That's a big part of Mm -hmm. this. Uh, A rejection of moralism is essential, I think, for a politics of liberty. 
politics of freedom. You don't want to speak on behalf of other people. This shouldn't be hard to explain. I don't understand why libertarians don't get this right away. Even if it's saying that the people of Bangladesh deserve property rights, you know, that's what if they don't want property rights, libertarians? Are you going to be imperialists and force and tell them they're wrong? You know, um, but um, yeah, that's what moralism is. It's making claims on behalf of people you've never met, never will meet. You don't even know they really exist except as a number or maybe an abstraction, you know? I mean, it's just the appalling arrogance and imperialism of saying something like, poor people need Medicare. Poor people need, you know, whatever. The people of the third world are X or Y anti-colonial, pro-colonial, whatever it is, you don't know. You don't know. And this goes back to our question about empathy, right? Yeah, I was... It's this false empathy. And that's really crazy. I mean, that's <laughs> crazy as a word you're not supposed to use if you're a postmodernist, but... Um, sure, or, or appalling. Really, but I, I mean... Say, it's arrogant. It's just incredibly arrogant, right? The presuming to know something that you can never, could, could never know. Mm. That's what that is, right? And yeah, and... It, but then again, I mean, what about arrogance as a trait is that a fad russell's opinion or is arrogance really a bad thing mm. great great question oh so back to war i mean um you said something like i don't think war is okay that's actually not true so i don't make a more i try not to make a moral claim about it so that's why i love blowback theory right because that's self-interested politics mm -hmm. the whole ron paul argument and Chalmers, Chalmers, Chalmers Johnson's argument, which is where it comes from, uh, it's speaking for us only, right? It's saying that if we bomb other people, we are likely to be bombed back. <laughs> yeah. And just historically speaking, there's quite a lot of evidence, right? You're not even necessarily making a prediction. You're just saying, hey, many times when we have bombed other people, they have bombed us, you know, 9-11 being just the most classic example, but you know, it just also stands to reason, I suppose, <laughs> that if you drop bombs on a village, the people in that village will not like you so much. And they might, if they have the means, do something to retaliate. You know, that's, I love that argument because it's not saying um, that it's not making claims about whether people in Yemen want war, should have war. It's just saying, I don't want to take part in it. I don't want to. I don't want to fund Saudi missiles that go into school buses in Yemen, right? Because I think not because I think it's immoral. I know this is really weird and hard, especially someone. I've been anti-war my entire life. When I was a lefty, that was my number one issue. And now that I'm not a lefty, it's still my number one issue. But I don't want to live in a. I don't want to be a part of that. Um, I don't like killing people, and that's maybe a moral moral thing inside of me that I can't dislodge, but I know that it's just a social construct and a moral claim because I'm actually not against killing people, right? I'm sometimes very much for killing people, like if they're trying to kill me. <laughs> um, or I suppose if they're trying to kill people I care for, you know, I would not hesitate if I really knew that to be the case. Um, but you really want to be self-interested in these things, right? And so like Israel, that's really the big, that's when this really comes out. So my position on Israel is I've never seen anyone take this position, but it seems to me the, the most commonsensical one, which is that I'm not anti-Zionist. I'm not opposed to the, the existence of the state of Israel. I just think it's a really bad idea for Jews. I just think it's a self-destructive idea for Jews. About 50,000 Jews in Israel have been killed since the founding of the state in various wars and in terrorist attacks, right? And the United States became the main um, supporter and funder of Israel beginning in 1967 under Lyndon Baines Johnson. That's when they made the, the turn toward Israel. France had before that been the supplier of their military stuff, but after 67, and you know what happened in 1968, James? A Palestinian named Sirhan Sirhan said that he needed revenge for his people and went out and shot Robert Kennedy and killed him because Robert Kennedy was all for supporting Israel. He was all for what Johnson had just done. He wanted Israel to get more guns and equipment and planes from the United States and really cement that relationship that became. So that was blowback, everybody. That was the first instance of blowback. That was the first terrorist attack on an American, against an American, by an Arab in human history. 
in U.S. history. That was the first time. And it was because the United States was funding this state. Now, why is it a bad idea, Israel? Why is it bad for Jews? And I am a quarter Jewish. My son is Jewish. I was married to a Jew. My mother's Jewish. <laughs> Half of my friends are Jewish. I think it's bad for us because Israel, they chose to, to put Israel in Palestine, which at the time, I think had 60 million Arabs surrounding it or in that area, in the immediate area of Palestine when it was founded, about 60 million, something like that. That was the estimate. And you're going to have a state that requires exclusion. You can't allow Arabs, non-Jews to become citizens of the state because it will be, cease to be a Jewish state if you do that. So it's by definition, either a race, a racist state or a or a religious state, but it's exclusionary. You can't allow non-Jews to be, and that's the case. I mean, it's almost impossible for non-Jews to become citizens of Israel. Well, you know, again, going back to blowback theory, well, what do you expect? And by the way, this is exactly what members of Harry Truman's cabinet said in 1947 and 1948 when they were deciding whether to recognize the state of Israel. This was George Marshall like the most famous and beloved general military figure. He was a secretary of state then in American history. Like this was the guy who was like running much of American foreign policy. This dude was like the man. He, you know what he said? He said, this is the worst idea possible. We're going to be in perpetual war if we fund and support this state of Israel, which is surrounded by 60 million Arabs. That's what he said. And guess what happened? Uh, Israel has been in perpetual war since 1948. There's never been a moment when Israel has really been at peace, surrounded by millions and millions of people who hate it because they took up all the perfect, the best beachfront property right there on the, on the East coast of the Mediterranean, right? And they don't allow the people to come back who once lived there and they don't allow non-Jews to live in this sweet spot right there with all the best beaches and everything and vineyards and hills and a lot of fertile land. You think they're not going to be annoyed at you <laughs> for doing that? And that's what they got. They've gotten perpetual war. And by funding it, by funding it and supporting it, we've had the target on our back too, because Palestinians and Arabs ain't stupid. They know why Israel exists, which is United States funding and sharing of military intelligence and all that, right? So this is why many Americans have been the targets of terrorist attacks. So you know, and I said 50,000 people have died, 50,000 50, Jews have died as a result of Israel's founding and existence. And they've done quite well, though, in New York and Los Angeles. So what on earth, how, what, how could it be a good idea, if you're a Jew, to choose to live in Israel, where you have a decent chance of getting blown up on a bus, or a very decent chance of getting drafted into the army and sent to a goddamn war, which has happened repeatedly, or move to fucking Brooklyn, you know, where they've done just fine last time I checked. And Los Angeles, all of the United States has been great for Jews, fantastic for Jews. We haven't had a lynching of a Jew since 1913, I think. Leo Frank case, I may be wrong about that date, but it was in the 1910s when Leo Frank was lynched in Atlanta. But uh, yeah, and Jews have done quite well. So just a bad idea for Jews. The, the typical left-wing opposition to, anti, to Zionism, to Israel, is this false empathy for Palestinians and taking this side of the... The reason we're opposed to Israel is because of what's happened to the poor Palestinians, and a lot has happened to the poor Palestinians for sure. But that's not the main reason I'm opposed to, to us funding Israel. What my pos position is, is go out there, go for it, Zionists. Have your, have your Jewish state in an ocean of Arabs right there. Good luck, but I'm not going to help you. And I mean that. Like, I'm not going to oppose it. I'm just saying, good luck. You go fight that fight. And if you can't win that fight without the greatest superpower in world history backing you up, then you might want to rethink the whole project, right? because that's exactly what it requires. It's such, a, such an impossible project. It's impossible for that to be sustainable without just immense military backup. And that's what's happened. It's an armed fortress now. So it's a, 
getting kind of back to postmodernism, I guess it's more of a cause and relation, or, sorry, cause and effect thing rather than like an ontological morality thing for you. Correct. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. And in yeah. much the same way, the, you don't, you don't think that beating yourself up because of what you may or may not have done as an alcoholic um, mm. is moral or immoral, but uh, that's right. It it's you beating yourself up and the effect of that is psychologically potentially pretty damaging. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I had a therapist, so I love dialectical behavior therapy, DBT. Yeah. I'm hoping to have DBT taught. Have you taken it? Have you done it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, it's the only thing that's really worked for me in terms of therapy, in terms of making me actually feel better. But I remember this like big moment I was feeling, I, I was in DBT about five years ago. <clears throat> and I remember a moment when I said something about how I felt guilty when I wasn't with my son, spending time with my son and the, the teacher, which is what DBT is. It's really a set of classes mostly, um, said, what, who is gaining from you feeling that way? does your son feel better? Does it help him? No. Cause I'm sitting by myself in my room, you know, when he's not there, he doesn't even know I'm thinking this and it's obviously not helping me. It's making my life much worse because I'm suffering from this feeling of guilt. Right. And it was just the most liberating thing. Now I, I wish I could adhere to her advice every day, but it certainly helps me at times. It's, you know, I, I say to myself, this guilt thing, which Brett was experiencing, it's only negative. It's only a bad thing. It only it's only makes you miserable and doesn't help the person you're guilty about one bit for you to feel guilty, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, worry about yourself. Make yourself safe and protected if you're Jewish. And don't worry about Palestinians. Don't worry about like the diaspora. Don't worry. What's the, what's the safest choice for me as a Jew is the question to live. And you can just do the math. Now, if you really, the thing is, people will say, well, it's, it is our land. <laughs> you know, if they go religious on you, I have no, I have no response. I'm like, yeah, okay. If, if it's because God tells you that you need to live here, which is what many Zionists believe, right? That that land belongs to Jews and should be inhabited by Jews. Well, then you go right ahead. You go right ahead and take, you know, take on 60 million Arabs. <laughs> I just don't want to, help you in that incredibly disastrous, self-destructive endeavor. Why do you think uh, postmodernism gets lumped in with cancel culture and just sort of the, I, I think of it as like a pathological collectivist version of um, sort of a well-meaning philosophy, I guess. Mm. Um, what do you think that is? Well, I guess see what happened was, and this is what James and I do in the course. And James completely agrees with me on this. Almost completely agrees with me. Um, what, what American left-wing woke politics are, are really just a revival of critical theory and the Frankfurt school, which is what we teach a lot of in that course. You will find the ideas being uh, spouted from the mouths of woke college sophomores um, in the works of Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, Adorno and Max Horkheimer um, and Gramsci to some extent. Uh, postmodernism is antithetical to woke politics. Woke politics is all about, James, you are a white man and that is just the most important thing about you. Um, that you're gay is like not nearly as important as it used to be but it gives you some benefits, I suppose, but you Much are, to my lament. yeah, but you, but you are a white man, cis also a cis white man. Um, and, um, that's, what's important. That's what determines who you are. That's essentialism. That's racism. That's, uh, gender essentialism too, you know? And postmodernism, that's exactly what postmodernism overturned, overthrew, and attacked relentlessly was this essentialist take on human beings, right? If you were born to a particular body, this means X, Y, and Z about you. That's precisely what Foucault took on in his, especially his early books. 
on the asylum and the, and the prison. <clears throat> um, so I think postmodernism, I mean, Foucault became super popular in the academy in the beginning of the 90s. His name was everywhere. And some of that language kind of seeped into other academic discourse. So they kind of at times sound a little bit like Foucault and a little bit like Derrida, but I actually don't really know because it's wrong. It's just a complete mislabeling. It's, it's critical theory and for the Frankfurt School that informs almost all left-wing thinking today. You know, that's not, that's not Marxist. The Marxists are a different thing, but they're also hostile to postmodernism. Marxists hate postmodernism because Marxism is a positivist philosophy. You know, Marx believed in material reality. In fact, he really insisted on this, that the material basis of society determines everything else in the society. Like it determines what the dominant ideology is. It determines the culture. It determines how people think and behave in a society is what the material basis is. And for him, the material basis was the economic structure, the economic system in that society. Um, so I don't know. It's just been this, Jordan Peterson is responsible primarily for doing this, for tagging postmodernism to like 20 year olds with blue hair screaming about your whiteness so uh, his his postmodern neo Marxists were neither of those things. No, I mean there were some Pomo people who were did have some little traces of Marxism in them, and those are the ones I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, but most certainly the big dudes Foucault and Derrida were, I mean their ideas were absolutely anti-socialist and anti-woke, anti-identity politics. Um, Foucault but also, was, but also not pro-capitalist. <clears throat> no, right. Well, they're skeptical of it, and I like them on that. I have no problem with that. I'm, yeah. I'm skeptical of it. I don't love every element of capitalism either. Leotard is the big critic of capitalism, but Foucault's main objects of criticism are state institutions, like I said, like the mental asylum and the prison. That's really what he went after, and cops. Um, but Leotard and other postmodernist thinkers did mostly critique capitalism. And they do kind of sound like the critical theorists at, sometimes mm -hmm. in their criticism of consumerism. Consumerism is what pisses off so much of the intellectual left. They really, really don't like that. They really hate that we buy stuff and want to buy stuff. And that's where false consciousness comes from, that idea, the concept that when you, <clears throat> this comes from Marcuse, a complete totalitarian, who um, says that um, you don't really want to buy those sneakers, the capitalists and their advertisers convinced you that you needed those sneakers. And that's the reason you're going to buy them. And by doing that, they stopped you from being a revolutionary. They essentially bought you off, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this phenomenally condescending, speak of, speaking of speaking for other people, right? On behalf of other people, my God, right? Presuming to know what you, someone I've never met, really wants and really needs. And presuming also, it's also really elitist and condescending, presuming that what you want is actually um, not your idea at all. It was given to you. So, you're so stupid and so childlike that an advertiser can put an ad on the screen and you will go buy that product, which also, by the way, if you know anything about business and the history of business is hilariously wrong, right? Imagine how great it would be to own a business if in fact your ads could convince anybody to buy the product. But in fact, anybody who's ever owned a business knows that any businessman is constantly trying to figure out what the fuck the consumers want. And trying, you know, it's constantly trying to figure out what they want rather than telling them what they should want. Imagine if I came up with Renegade University and I was just like, and the marketing campaign was, you need to take these courses. You and then to. just everyone took the courses because that's what period. They did. <laughs> yeah, you need to take these courses. These are great courses. These are really good courses. They're so awesome. They're great. And you need to take them because what your other courses you would take are just not good. They're not your real needs and desires. I don't think I would have sold a damn thing. <laughs> it's hilarious how stupid and wrong they are about capitalism, like the basic workings of capitalism, because they've never owned a business. This is the thing about academics, right? They've lived in incubators their whole damn lives. 
most of them went straight from college to graduate school and straight from graduate school to teaching as a professor. They've never had to struggle in the market the way that most people do. It's, it's amazing. They're just children when it comes to economics because of that. Well, and they, they conflate the sort of fascistic corporate s sort of merger of state and business with, you know, the mom and pop shop. I mean, yeah. if you ask any socialist, they, they'll tell you that, you know, shop local, you know, if you're in a shop, <laughs> buy it from the mom and pop shop. And of course they're poor, so they can't shop local because, you know, the, the state does prop up Walmart and Amazon and make it so that they can, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, import and cheap shit. And then, yeah, I mean, and there's economies of, there's also economies of scale, right? Yeah. The bigger entities can produce stuff cheaper, right? Yeah, I know. So do you think we're, do you think we're in the middle of a mass hysteria right now? Uh, we're in the middle of several, although I guess right yeah. now it's a, a little bit calmed down um, because the election is over. And isn't it amazing that in the same week that the elect, that the inauguration happened, <laughs> let's see, California, Governor Newsom has announced that he will be lifting his stay at home order. Huh. All of a sudden and talking about how the numbers for COVID are good. He's never said anything good about COVID numbers. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, four days after the inauguration, James, that seems so it must be just a coincidence. Lori Lightfoot, right around the inauguration, said, we must open bars and restaurants. And she said this, as soon as possible. And this is a woman who was running around like for months and months, shaming people, yelling at them. She's the mayor of Chicago, right? For not adhering to her stay-at-home uh, lockdown orders. Andrew Cuomo, governor, the great governor of New York State, said in a tweet, again, right around the inauguration, that we must reopen. We cannot stay shut down. We must end the lockdowns. Not, wow, this it, is it, and not only yeah. is he the great governor, but also the Emmy award-winning governor for his performance on television during the pandemic. Oh, really? He won an Emmy? Yes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Uh, and then DC is the other one. They reopened as well. The guy who knowingly sent thousands of COVID patients who were positive back into nursing homes. Mm -hmm and thereby killed thousands and thousands of people. He should be in prison. And I'm, and I'm anti-prison, but he should be in prison. <laughs> uh, God, I mean, I remember I said in the last summer, like early on, I was like, watch, watch. This is all about the election. And if Biden wins, they will lift the lockdowns. And people were like, oh, Thad, that's so conspiratorial. I'm like, we're talking about the people who ran Russiagate. Hmm. Really, they're not, those people are not capable of cheating, of lying, of, of conspiring against Donald Trump in ways that would hurt the country. Jesus Christ, like, that's all they do. This current iteration of the Democratic Party, let me say this right here and now, is the most corrupt institution I have witnessed in my lifetime. They've never been good. They've always been bad. But, you know, the Democratic Party of the 1970s was actually mostly anti-war for a bit. They weren't a bunch of just careerist, corrupt criminals. These are criminals, like big time. I mean, I've just never seen the Clintons and Biden and the Obama team. I just they're just so ruthless and corrupt. They will clearly do anything to win an election and to retain their power. And most importantly, and this is really what it's at, about, is maintain their main project. People don't understand this. The American empire, that's a liberal democratic project. Mm -hmm. They invented that. They invented it and they pushed it and they extended it and they will not go down without a fight. They will, and Trump represented a threat to the American empire simply because he was just asking questions about it, which no president has ever done, ever, unprecedented, right? Democratic Party built the damn thing. Woodrow Wilson, World War I, right? Uh, FDR, uh, what came out of that? The whole international system of governance, the United Nations, World Court, all of it, IMF. Yeah, the bases built all around, 800 bases all around the world. Most of those were built under Democratic administrations. The CIA was, was invented by Harry Truman. Great, not just a Democrat, a very liberal Democrat. The Vietnam War. Very liberal Democrats, Kennedy and Johnson, started it and escalated it. Nixon actually drew it down. I mean, he killed bunches of people. I'm not excusing him, 
By the way, Nixon was a total progressive, though. On his domestic right. policies, he was to the left of Johnson. There was more welfare spent under Nixon than under Johnson. Um, he had a price fix. He, he, he froze, uh, froze prices. Like, my goodness, how progressive is that, right? Well, and let's not forget the taking us off the gold standard, which is the yeah you know, the 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 most progressive of all the progressive. I mean, I I right. am I, I frequently say that the progressive era didn't end because like the progressives were defeated. It's because it became axiomatic. That's just the default state now. Bingo, um, bingo. Yeah, Republicans. The Republicans have simply been an adjunct to that project. The Democratic. It's the Democratic Party is. Yeah it's the democratic party that built all this stuff. Have you yeah. read, uh, uh, Angelo Cotavia's essay where he, he kind of shows how the ruling class is the democratic party and the Republican party are like junior partners who aspire to be the ruling class, but never quite make it. No, but he's right. Yeah. But yes. That's exactly. It's fantastic. How- I don't remember what, uh, it might've been like, well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't remember where it was published, but it's no longer available anywhere but archive.org. Whatever publication it was <laughs> took it down. Um, it's really good. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll put send a link in, the, in, the, in yeah. the notes too. It's really good. Please, Please yeah. Um, great. Hmm. So uh, being that we're kind of living in this era where um, people just are going insane with their authoritarianism and their... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, need for the perception of safety and all that. What what can we as normal just kind of want to get along to go along people do to survive the next decade or so? How do we survive the next decade? <clears throat> what should we do? Lenin said, what is to be done? Very famously. Yeah. In essence. What is to be done, James? Well, let me gather around, children. Let me tell you what you should do with your lives. Mr. Uh, Ant Empathy here, Mr. Don't Speak on Behalf of Others. Well, okay, so if you want the same kinds of things that I want in the political world, in the social world, in the world outside your head, I'd say work on your head, number one. Work on your health, your body. Make it as healthy as possible. And then right after that, work on your mental health. And you've done a lot of mental health work, I know, and I've done quite a bit myself. But um, that's number one. I mean, it's sort of like uh, corny and new agey sounding, but yes, it sort of begins with what's between your ears. If you, um, if you can handle stress better, if you can be less triggered by things, if you can um, remain focused rather than getting on what's important, rather than getting distracted by things that, that trigger you, that make you emotional, you will be more effective in communicating and in persuading people to do whatever you want. Um, we need to, and then beyond that, I would say we need to deinstitutionalize. Everyone needs to actively deinstitutionalize, which means not just leaving institutions, but building our own. So that's what Renegade University is all about. It's it's replacing higher education with another model, another an alternative that's freer, that's better, that gives me what I want as, an, as a teacher and as a student. I'm also a student there. <laughs> um, build institutions, build institutions with cryptocurrency, right? That uh, can't be traced, the government can't control it really, or has a hard time doing that. Build your own communication network, have a podcast, right? Uh, do that, you build if you wanna go fully self-sufficient and agorist, you know, build, make your own food, trade with people, barter with people. Uh, we have to have our own platforms, build a social media platform because we're all going to get kicked off of Twitter mm-hmm. pretty soon. I think looks that way. Also, we don't really want to be a part of Twitter if they're taking off a lot of in- interesting people. Right. So build your own platforms, build your own community. That's again, what RU is also very much about. Build your own community. So much of us in this space, your listeners, you, me, my listeners, that's what we all share, I think, is a profound feeling of alienation and isolation in places where we live. 
because we are weirdos. We think in different ways. Uh, one of the ways in which we're weird is that we think. Most Americans don't think. They're not interested in ideas. They're not intellectuals at all. They're anti-intellectual. So build a community that's online, virtual, and all across the world, and also build a community right in your hometown where you're living. So I know you've done a lot of this kind of thing, actually. I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but yeah, like meetups, you know, we're going to start, I'm going to start doing meetups for RU people and unregistered people in the Bay Area. Hmm. It'll be free. That'll be just social um, to build a real community that I have access to. Because man, I walk, and this is the Bay Area, right? This is like the capital of like liberal wokeness um i feel like an alien all the time here and i feel completely afraid to speak my mind and i know that is very common for a lot of people who are listening right now it's a common feeling so um build your own space your own people spaces physical spaces you know if you can buy some land buy some property and make it not just a home, but a place, a hub, a hub of cultural yeah. activity, right? Have people come and create things there, you know, and a podcast just needs a, all you need is a room, a quiet room with, with internet access. That's all you need to do a podcast. You could have a house and have a room where it's a studio where people can come and make their own podcasts, right? Or your garage or make their own stuff, make their own cannabis, make their own, whatever it is, make their own beer, make their own food, produce their own newsletters, make their own courses, you know, teach people. But everyone should be focused on that and less focused, I think, on, I mean, I'm 100% guilty of this. So, you know, I think we, we would benefit from spending less of our emotional energy uh, attacking and criticizing and complaining about the establishment, right? And we could redirect that energy into building our own establishments, <laughs> institutions or non-institutions or whatever you want to call them, free spaces, right? That's what I'm doing. I mean, that's what, that's what Renegade University and Unregistered really are all about is facilitating that for other people and mostly for me. I mean, I'm, I want my own community. I, I'm, I hate feeling alone all the time. I hate feeling like a weirdo who's got something wrong with him because he, you know, brings up the fact that Joe Biden was the author of the crime bill, <laughs> right? Why would you say that now? We have to say nothing but positive things because Trump is the devil and we're going to, you know, I'm really tired of that. And it's just in a place like this, especially that's pretty much everyone thinks that. I mean, so we're real freaks out here, but you know, just in the Bay area, I got lots of people here, you know, I hang out with lots of people who are unregistered listeners, members of RU, and we're going to start ramping that up and doing a lot of it. We had one hangout, which was awesome at the beach uh, last summer, but I want to do a lot more now. So do that in your own hometown. And it's so easy now with the internet, with means of communic communication that we have um, and make it physical, make it real. It's really good to have online virtual relationships, but you also got to hug people. You got to hug people. You got you to gotta see their eyes. You got to smell them. <laughs> you got to really, really, like you really got to experience the full person you know, to have a real communion with them. So that's what I say you should do. Those are my recommendations. These are recommendations. These are not moral pronouncements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, all right. Well, I think, I think that's, that's a pretty good place to stop. Do you, yeah. uh, what do you, what do you have to plug other than Renegade University, which uh, I will for sure be linking to whatever the next course is by the time it's published. We're, for the audience's sake, we're recording this on January 26th. It'll probably post in a week or two. And oh. I know as fast as things are going right now, like talking about current events is always precarious, I think. Okay. In that case, I know exactly. So your listeners will be super interested in two things that we have coming up. Mm -hmm. I promise. One is a webinar taught by Control Pew is his uh, online name, but his real name is Alex Holiday. A lot of your listeners might actually know who this is. On 3D printed guns, make your own guns, it's called. And over three weeks in March, Alex will teach you how to buy a printer, which costs only about 200 bucks, by the way, and make your own damn guns. And these are guns that are almost every type you can make on your 3D, print, 3D printer. 
he will lead you through this. He is, uh, he has a very popular and very well-known website and YouTube channel that people have been using for year, for about a year and a half now. Um, and he's just the perfect teacher for it. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And it's like, would you think another university would offer that kind of course ever? <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely and actually, not. I think the, yeah, the, the 3d printed gun thing. Um, I think people are still, living a few years ago when, you know, oh, don't 3D print a gun. It's going to blow up in your hand. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing what he has to offer. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of people have printed and made their own guns in mm -hmm. the last five to six years. So that's coming up. That's a webinar over three Wednesdays in March, first three Wednesdays in March. Go to renegadeuniversity.com for that. And you'll see it under video courses. Also, also on the front page. And then, oh my... April 9th, 10th, and 11th, block out your calendars because it's going to be the biggest RU weekend event ever. And I really mean this. We have five special guests that are amazing in uh, their star power and just, it's going to be so much fun. So we've got in Texas, it's going to be called RU Texas. It's going to be in um, Lockhart, Texas, which is 30 minutes south of Austin at the property, the three acre property of Buck Johnson, who is a podcaster, part of our network. His podcast is called Counterflow. He owns his three acre property in Lockhart, which is the barbecue capital of Texas. There are three world famous barbecue joints in the town that are walking distance from Buck's house. The special guests are Scott Horton, Cody Wilson, Hotep Jesus, Deirdre McCluskey, and Jack, the Perfume Nationalist from the Perfume Nationalist podcast. Wow. This is off the chain. Uh, tickets will go really fast. We're only going to sell 100 tickets. 100 tickets, that's it. So I pretty much guarantee it's going to sell out. So definitely get those tickets fast. Again, just go to the front page of renegadeuniversity.com and uh, check it out and buy your tickets. RU Texas, April 9th, 10th, and 11th in Lockhart, Texas. I'm for sure going to be there as well. Not that, oh, I'm, yeah. uh, not that I'm a special guest or giving a speech or anything. That's going to be really interesting with a perfume nationalist who's a bit of a, yeah. I don't know, reactionary, but also gay. And Deirdre McCloskey, who's a classical liberal, but also trans. Yes. Um, see, <laughs> and Hotep Jesus, who's a conservative, but also yes. budding anarchist and also black. Like this is, yes. this is going to be a really cool, like kind of star studded, and Cody and Scott, I mean, just them alone would have oh, yeah. been huge. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, meeting Scott Horton in person too. That'll be a... Oh my God. This is a cra <laughs> it's crazy. I couldn't believe we pulled this off. Yeah, I was just, it, it all came together and I'm just so thankful. It's going to be awesome. Cool. Can't wait for it. All right. Great. Good. Well, Thad, thanks so much. I'll let you get back to work on your book, which I am <laughs> looking forward to reading. Uh, oh, and Renegade History, too. It's been blowing up. I gave it away as Christmas gifts. Uh, yeah. I've seen rappers posing with it online. Like, it's just... Wiz Khalifa, Wiz Khalifa. yeah. Yeah, He's it's going nuts. It. So that's awesome. Well, cool. Thanks so much, Thad. I'll talk to you soon. This was great, James. Thank you. All right. Thanks, as always, to Thad for joining me today. Just so you know, Thad is going to be hosting an event down in Texas this spring, so be on the lookout for that. In addition, he obviously has all kinds of courses and exciting offerings over at Renegade University, um, so I will put links to all of that in my description for this episode. Please be sure that you are subscribed wherever you're listening to this, whether that's on Odyssey, Substack, or on one of the inferior streaming services. I really appreciate your thumbs up, your likes, your subscriptions, ratings and reviews, and all of that. And with that, this is another episode of Blackbird in the Can, and I'll see you on the next one. Until then, live free.